Well, this is a bit of a surprise turn of events. AMD managed to somewhat exceed my expectations. I had expected Gamescom to be an utter clown show of an announcement, but they did show off some stuff that was interesting and worth getting a bit excited for. Let's discuss that in this video. Hey, if you enjoy content like this, drop a like, make sure to subscribe, and smash that bell so you never miss another video. Hey, what is going on guys? Danny here. Welcome back to the channel and I hope you've all been doing well. So at Gamescom, AMD finally unveiled their RX 7800 XT and RX 7700 XT graphics cards that are targeted towards the mid-range GPU segments. With the addition of the RX 7800 XT and 7700 XT, AMD has confirmed that the portfolio of RDNA 3 GPUs is now complete. There could be some other variations that might release in the future like a 7750 XT or 7850 XT, but as for ASICs, they're done. Don't expect expect a larger Navi 31 GPU to appear in the future. Is that going to complete the RDNA 3 portfolio or is there maybe more on the horizon? <laughs> uh, well, the RDNA 3 portfolio is now complete. So uh, of all the products that we have planned to launch, uh, that is, this is the, the last few products that we will launch. We may have some different versions, um, but they're not, not, not a new ASIC, if you will. Uh, we should be done. We're done, and um, you know we're excited, and, and I think we now have the broad spectrum covered for people who want RDNA 3 up and down the price stack. As for the actual announcement itself, AMD have exceeded my expectations, but in some other ways, they continue to the trend of missing opportunities that could have made a decent announcement into a really great announcement, though it wasn't a total letdown. Let's start off with the negatives, and that is these GPUs AMD have announced at a hardware level are not really impressive. In fact, when you compare the RX 7800 XT to the 6800 XT, its last gen counterpart, you're actually getting a downgrade. The 6800 XT has 72 compute units and 4608 shaders, whereas with the 7800 XT, you're getting a 60 compute unit GPU and 3840 shaders. Now, this wouldn't really be an issue had RDNA 3 actually performed like AMD had touted it would, but there's plenty of tests online which have shown that when you compare RDNA 3 and RDNA 2 clock for clock, same specs, it's really not that much faster, if at all. There was a pretty good video done by a channel called I'm a Mac who showed how the 7600 and 6600 XT were basically neck and neck when configured this way, which demonstrated the lack of improvements from RDNA 3. Along with that, AMD's own benchmark numbers showcase the Chinese and OEM exclusive RX 7900 GRE, which does have better specs than the 6800 XT to only be around 10% faster. Hardware Unboxed also managed to get their hands on the 7900 GRE, and found that on average it was only just 10% faster and in some cases even lost which is pretty embarrassing. So for those folks out there who are saying this 7800 XT is going to be offering 6800 XT like performance, it will not. Maybe in some select few titles that favor RDNA 3 it might, but most of the time this card is going to be performing like an RX 6800 non-XT, which you can find brand new right now for around $430 on Newegg. And that makes you wonder, why didn't they just call it an RX 7800? AMD showed a slide pitting the 7800 XT against the 4070, which makes it seem like better value as the 4070 has an MSRP of $599, so $100 more, but once this card hits store shelves, a competent reviewer will show you that the 4070 will be faster on average as it trades blows with the 38. At the very least though, they didn't price it as expensive as I thought they were going to because many rumors out there were circulating around stating AMD were going to be releasing the 7800 XT at around $550, which would have made it instantly DOA. At $500, it is a much better buy than the 16GB RTX 4060 Ti in my opinion, but when you take a look at things this way, you just have to compare it to everything else that is new, and it looks kind of alright, but you also have to remember... All the other new alternatives weren't that great to begin with. Moving on to the 7700 XT, this is actually an intriguing card because when you take a look at the specs of the GPU itself, it's not that much cut down from the 7800 XT. However, this model has 12 gigabytes of VRAM, so that's 4 gigabytes less, and it has a slimmer memory bus. I'm expecting this card to perform like an RTX 3070, which wouldn't be too bad had AMD priced this card at around $400. However, AMD just could not help themselves, and once again, we see them utilizing their upselling strategy because at $449, this GPU is DOA. You have plenty of other viable alternatives on the market to consider, such as this $430 68 I pointed out earlier, 
Or if you want the latest, you're better off just paying the extra $50 like they want and just getting the 7800 XT. For those who are looking for the ultimate value and you're in the camp that says, no, these new options are horrible because they don't really move the needle, well, the best option for you is to go used. Boom, here you go, $400 RTX 3080, doesn't get much better than that. So really when you think about it, if AMD's plan was to give really good value, then the 7700 XT should have been around $380 and the 7800 XT should have been $450, in my opinion. At those prices, they would have made them look a lot more appealing and there wouldn't be much reason to consider the new Nvidia counterparts. Now here's where the good parts start, and that is AMD is finally going to be bringing some features that will be enticing to gamers. The biggest feature that I thought was quite appealing is that FSR 3 with fluid motion frames, which is similar to Nvidia's DLSS 3 frame generation technology, will actually work on a driver level. Along with that, being able to have this feature work on older Radeon 6000 and 5000 series cards will be huge. If they can truly make fluid motion frames work on every game, then they can essentially cut out the middleman, which in this case are the game devs, to ensure this feature can work with any game the user wants, as long as it's running on DX11 or the DirectX 12 API. I'm fairly certain though that later on they'll get it to work on Vulkan. I also liked how they incorporated the separate features in their adrenaline software like Radeon Boost, Anti-Lag, and Radeon Super Resolution into just a one-click feature called HyperRx. These are the types of gamer-oriented features that will appeal to a lot of users, and for the folks out there who just want to boost their performance, but not have to fiddle around with overclocking software, graphic settings, and other stuff. Then later on, once their frame generation technology has been released, that too will be added into HyperRx and can be enabled with one click. What I would have liked to see more of is AMD explaining how some of these technologies work with a more in-depth explanation. For instance, Radeon Anti-Lag Plus. Like what exactly is this tech and how does it work on reducing latency to make games feel more responsive? Nvidia's comparable feature would be their GeForce Reflex feature. You can read about this feature in their Ada white paper and they do have quite a few different videos on their channel showing comparisons. They have an SDK you can download. Along with that, they do even have a Reflex analyzer tool you can download to monitor latency and measure the impacts of the tech. So it seems like AMD are taking a page or a few pages out of Nvidia Nvidia's book here and are now pivoting towards selling gamers on software. This was something I discussed when Nvidia released the RTX 4060 and 4060 Ti. They too have come to the realization here that they can get away with selling less hardware to gamers if they can get the software to do the heavy lifting for them and have some features that are enticing to gamers. And guess what? It's going to work. I'll be making a separate video on this to have a more in-depth discussion, but these days you can just see the amount of new releases we are getting on the PC from AAA Triple A devs were upscaling whether it'd be DLSS or FSR are being heavily promoted. In some cases, they are even being recommended to use by devs or they're telling gamers they're required to target a certain performance threshold. This is working because just look at how much discussion there was surrounding Starfield and DLSS. It's almost as if there are now gamers out there that absolutely rely on this technology to boost their performance. When it comes to upscaling, this is something that I myself have used on many occasions, though my limit is just to use the quality mode where overall image fidelity isn't noticeably impacted and you get a bit of a performance boost if needed. If I'm able to meet my performance target without upscaling then it gets turned off. There are a lot of other graphical features you can turn off that will help boost performance before you even have to rely on upscaling. But I don't know, it just seems like people these days just want a one-click easy solution, whereas they don't want to take 5 to 10 minutes of their time to, you know, play around with a few settings to optimize their performance. Frame generation is interesting because in some titles I have used it, like Hitman 3 or Flight Simulator, but those games don't necessarily require a lot of fast input from the user, so things like input latency can be overlooked. I would personally never use frame gen tech in a multiplayer title, or first person shooter or games where you know quick input or precise timings are required. Imagine trying to play Dark Souls 3 or Elden Ring with frame rate interpolation. Not that those games need it, but I'm just giving an example here. But if your game is similar to those titles and your performance is so terrible that you basically suggest to gamers that you need frame gen tech to get playable performance, then that is just lazy optimization and not a future I want to see unfortunately. I just won't play those games. But circling back to AMD though, I think in some ways they're headed into the right direction and they don't appear as hopeless as they did before. With that said, we still need to see these technologies in action. 
How will AMD's frame gen tech compare against NVIDIA's, who have leveraged AI and machine learning with hours of training to get their model to work right? Will AMD even be able to meet their target deadline? Remember, FSR 3 was supposed to come out earlier this year, but was delayed. So there's still a lot of questions that need to be answered and will only be answered once we have the tech in our hands to test. Well, those are my thoughts on AMD's announcement of the mid-range GPUs and FSR 3 with fluid motion frames. We'll touch base in the next video, guys. Take care. If you guys found this video to be informative and entertaining, then leave a like. Let me know your thoughts and comments down below. Be sure to check out the video description for cool links and ways to support the channel, such as using my Amazon affiliate link. And if you're interested in seeing more content like this, then consider subscribing. I'd greatly appreciate it. Thank you guys so much for watching. Take care, and I'll see you in the next one.